afternoon. My name is Tom Beaker, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Nebraska History Museum on the third Thursday of each month. A detailed schedule for this series, as well as information on historical society activities and programs, can be found on our website, www.nebraskahistory.org. Before introducing today's speaker, I would like to thank the Nebraska State Historical Foundation for funding for the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Historian Paul Hedren is a retired National Park Service superintendent and for many years has been a good personal friend. He now resides in Omaha and is the author of a number of Sioux War studies. And today, Paul will talk about Captain Jack Crawford and the Black Hills Gold Rush. Paul? Well, good noon. Um, it's been my pleasure to be uh, in this room in front of in front of many of you, I think, uh, on a number of occasions, uh, talking Sioux War matter. And uh, this book, my most recent book, is actually kind of a spin out of that, um, but it's at its heart a Black Hills Gold Rush story. Um, this isn't scripted, so I'm going to just kind of tell you how I got into Captain Jack, uh, who he is as a character, and what, uh, and what he did for all of us. Um, in, in my, uh, I came on to him uh, in my readings into the, in the Sioux War story. Um, you can't help but, if you care about General Crook and the summer campaign of 1876 and the Starvation March and Slim Buttes and all that stuff, that's not Little Bighorn, but still part of that story. You can't help but chance on to this character, Captain Jack Crawford, uh, the poet scout. Um, he's a Buffalo Bill lookalike. He was a Buffalo Bill pal, and he indeed was with uh, Crook on that starvation march and played a rather prominent role uh, at Slim Buttes, this guy did. Um, he's a message carrier after the battle, carrying Crook's or dispatches reporting that battle to the nearest telegraph. That's how I came to know him. Um, you get into Buffalo Bill literature and you come across this pal of Buffalo Bills, um, uh, for a while anyway, Captain Jack Crawford. Um, he indeed was a poet. He's a published author. Um, in Chasing Sioux War Stories, I came on to a number of his books and acquired them, not because I particularly fancy, you know, kind of his doggerel, because it's really kind of, it's, it's foreign poetry to us today. But the head notes to all of his poems told why it was he wrote that piece of doggerel, um, where he was, whether sitting on Wall Bill Hickok's grave in Deadwood in a September day in 1876, how it was he came there, or how it was he came to hear the news of Custer, his most famous poem, um, Have You Heard the News of Custer? Well, how it is in those head notes, how he came to, 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 have, that, uh, to, to, to have that story and write that poem. That's how I came to understand this guy. Um, he or came to, was introduced to this guy. He, his biographer, um, a friend of mine, Darlis Miller, who uh, some years ago, 15 years ago, was a professor of history at New Mexico State University. I did a very fine book. There have been a number of biographies, but this is clear in a way the best. Um, published about 15 years ago. I acquired, I, 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 we, she and I collaborated on a couple of details, uh, particularly the Sioux War stuff, and when the book came out, I just couldn't help but want to have it fast and want to read it fast to see what she had discovered new about Jack Crawford and the Sioux War. Again, that kind of plays to this, this, uh, this obsessive interest of mine in these sort of studies. And she had some, she, she told good stories, but, but better yet, and what leads straight to this book is, as she's doing a biography of Captain Jack, in 1875, Captain Jack, kind of unknown to me, um, is in the Black Hills with the Dodge Expedition. 
And Captain Jack goes back to the Black Hills in January 1876 as a, as a correspondent for the Omaha Bee newspaper. And Darlis Miller, the biographer, she says, as she's, as she's researching this dimension of his story, she says, you know, she encountered as many as 30 letters written by Jack Crawford to the Omaha Bee recounting his experiences in the earliest days of the Black Hills Gold Rush. Well, when you, uh, when you write and you chase stories, you chase histories, uh, that proved enormously interesting to me. I had a day job then and uh, I wrote in dribs and drabs, but I've always kept a list of things I ought to chase someday, and this became one of those. Uh, and uh, when I retired six years ago, I had projects to complete and I got interested in something else entirely, but the day came to wonder about just what were these letters to the Omaha Bee newspaper. And was there the essence of a small story there or was the es there the essence of a big story? Um, it, just, it just beckoned. Well, I went first, I moved to Omaha, I went first to the Douglas County Historical Society. Um, wondering where the legacy is, the business legacy of the Omaha Bee newspaper. In the 19th century, it's the biggest paper in town. Um, and wondering whether um, anybody there that this archivist might know had, uh, had uh, done anything with these letters that I had, that I knew of. Um, my now new friend there, he knew nothing about Captain Jack and he knew nothing about these letters and, and he said, uh, as I've discovered others can do, he says, well, and we know all about the B. You know, we don't have their corporate papers because they, they maybe don't exist, but we've got the B newspaper on microfilm and you're welcome to go over there and read it. Well, I was looking for the easy way out and of course he didn't help me at all. I came over here to the Historical Society and uh, among the uh, crack archivists over there, over at the headquarters, um, they knew of Captain Jack because he really was something of a 19th century character. Um, they certainly, we all know of the bee, although they didn't, I think you don't profess to have any corporate papers either uh, in, at the Historical Society. That vexes me still, where are they? Because it has to be a rich body of paper. Either that exists or was hauled to the Omaha dump. Um, and they didn't have Omaha B, you know, kind of uh, paper on file, but they had the microfilms, and I was welcome to go over there and read them, you know, just as I had heard over in, I had heard over in Omaha. There was going to be no easy way to get into this and really understand what did these 30 letters or so amount to, but to sit down and read the paper, read those microfilms. Now, my friends in Lincoln here were at least allowed me to take those films home. I could check them out. I have a wonderful reader at home. I have wonder, wonderful research uh, capabilities at home. And, and I read three years of the Omaha Bee newspaper. According to Darlis Miller, um, he is out there with the Dodge Expedition in 1875. And so I backed up into the start of the Dodge Expedition and started reading the Bee. I was rather disappointed, actually, in the coverage in the B in 1875. I found no letters signed by Jack Crawford or John Wallace Crawford or Captain Jack, the names that we, we know him by. Um, I saw two marvelous letters written by a guy named Ned, which I copied, but then I copied everything related to the gold rush out of the papers. Uh, there were some interesting accounts written by some officers that were with Dodge that appeared in other papers first and were copied in the B. So there was good gold rush news. And there were these two Ned letters, but I started out being rather frustrated and, you know, I just wondered, what is she talking about? And I spooled up the, 19, the 1876 roll of film and I wasn't three days or four days into the paper for that year when there was a beautiful long letter written from Custer, no, from Sydney then, um, signed by Captain Jack. And I kept reading and about every week for the next six months there was such a letter. Um, really interesting, good, long letters. You know, when you 
when you when you touch this kind of stuff, you worry about uh, you know. I mean, sometimes correspondence and sometimes letters amount to uh, so many days on the trail. There's so many so many miles on the trail today, and it was a dry camp, or and there was no wood, or there whatever you know, just the barest minimum. But not that's not what the way this guy wrote. It was just long, lucid, um, provocative sort of letters. Uh, describing his friends and describing the adventures on the trail and describing just the nightmare of crossing the North Platte River um, in January before the Clark Bridge, six months before there is a Clark Bridge, and uh, wet to the knees and getting to the finally to the North Bank and the first thing they all had to do was build a big bonfire and strip naked practically to dry themselves off. Now that's the sort of stuff you want to see in a letter reporting travel. Well, I found ultimately, um, Darla says there were maybe 30 of these letters. I found ultimately 40 letters just like this. And early on, um, as I came to understand that there's, there's some real potential here, I went to an old friend uh, at the South Dakota State Historical Society and suggested to uh, my editor friend there that I think we have a marvelous South Dakota story. It doesn't go marvelous Nebraska spin to it all, but there's a marvelous South Dakota story. This is gold rush lore at its best, stuff that's never been seen before. Uh, the biographer only gleaned you know, little details out of it that expanded a biography, and she wasn't reporting on the gold rush as he was. And she asked me to send a couple of letters up to her, and I did, and, and uh, we, we struck off on a, on a book project from the, almost from the get-go. The character, you know, the guy that becomes this correspondent for the B, John Wallace Crawford is his, is his full name, proper name. Um, he comes to America um, from Ireland um, in the late 1850s as a kid by himself. His parents immigrated here a few years earlier, leaving the family behind in the care of family there. And uh, this kid picks up and comes to America by himself and reunites with his parents who live in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, that's in eastern Pennsylvania, and spends the next few years, you know, strapping kid years um, as a slate picker in the anthracite coal mines in eastern Pennsylvania. It's the sort of work a kid, as he says, could get. He couldn't read, he couldn't write, he's a strapping kid, an enormous personality, but that's, that, that was just about what life amounted to at that moment. Um, he comes of age during the Civil War, um, before the end of the Civil War. Um, late in the war, he joins his father's Pennsylvania Infantry Regiment, and, and which is engaged with the Army of the Potomac and, uh, and deeply in battle. He is a young, now a middle-aged teenager, just uh, he joins at 17, so 17 or 18, he's wounded um, seriously in the hip. Um, it was one of those life-threatening sort of injuries. He's hospitalized for months at a Catholic Sisters of Charity Hospital in Philadelphia, and some nun there takes an interest in him and teaches him to read and write. And he, as he later regaled audiences ever after, and that was just a turning point in his life that someone took this interest in him and brought and introduced him to the letters. Um, he goes back to war, he recovers that wound, and goes back to war and is wounded yet again. Um, and recovers from that, but ever more. Um, has this special fondness for Civil War veterans. Um, the story of the Civil War walked with a limp for the rest of his days because of that. After the war, um, she doesn't tell us much about it. I can't see by any other biography that we know very much about this guy for a few years. Um, he marries. Um, a couple of children are born to this marriage. He's a postmaster of a small town in eastern Pennsylvania, very near Pottsville, where he grew up. Um, someplace along the way um, meets, and I think we know where, meets Buffalo Bill and meets Bill Hickok, who play the stage very near, play the Pottsville stage, um, when he's in this, this is his combination show era of his life where you know, he's scouting out here and he's doing what he does, you know, hunting buffalo and whatever and scouting with the army periodically, but you know, he spends his winter on the eastern stage 
reenacting these great Western adventures. That's his combination show era. Jack had to have been exposed to him. Uh, Bill plays his hometown twice inside of 11 months, and he's living 15 miles away. So there has to be this connection because Jack simply is filled with wanderlust, and thus it is he comes to Omaha and connects to the bee. He does that in 1875, in mid-1875, um, leaving his wife and leaving his children behind, uh, which is a recurring detail in this man's life. Um, he comes to, he connects with Edward Rosewater of the Bee, the editor of the Bee, when he hits town. Uh, not as a correspondent, but uh, the Bee was looking for someone, a night watchman, to, uh, you know, just kind of tend a shop. Well, a shop's closed. Uh, the threats evidently came from other newspapers. You know, there's the Omaha Republican and the, there's the Omaha Herald operating at the same time, and they must not have liked each other at all because uh, they're fighting each other, there's fisticuffs between editors all the time, they write the vilest stuff about each other in the paper, and so to read these other papers is just to get a real slice of at least a journalistic life in, in, uh, in my hometown. Um, and Jack, you know, very heroically defends the paper one night. Now he's working for Rosewater, but this brings him to, in Rosewater's eyes, to another level. Um, you know, he's quick-witted, um, he evidently was quick with a pistol, although never used it, but brandished it in a manner of defending the, the enterprise. And Rosewater offers to send him west. And again, this kind of plays into the way I see Jack anyway coming out here. He is just filled with wanderlust, and, and uh, he wants into the great adventure of the day. The great adventure of the day is the Black Hills Gold Rush. You know, gold was discovered there by Custer the previous summer, and truly discovered there. Uh, but that was a mission where gold discovery was truly incidental to why they were in the Black Hills in 1874. But in 1875, there was this second government survey sent that way to really survey the gold fields, you know, to come to some sense of what this amounts to because this is Indian country and you know, and if there's gold rush to ensue there, we've got to deal with the Indian issue and to understand how much we're going to have to pay for it, they needed to survey it. And that's the Dodge, that's the Dodge expedition in 1875. Well, Rosewater invites him to connect with the Dodge expedition and write letters to the bee. It's very clear that uh, that's his intent. I just couldn't understand for a while why I didn't see any Jack letters. I saw those Ned letters, and I didn't understand the Ned letters until I started to see the Jack letters later on. Uh, because the prose is the same, the manner, the light, the light, light hearted nature of, of, of the way he, he, he reports on his friends and reports on episodes, and the fact that in the Ned letters and in the Jack letters, he laces them with bits of doggerel, you know, little snippets of poetry. Now, you gotta, you know, there's a, there's a style parallel here because you just didn't see this otherwise. So I'm absolutely convinced that the Ned letters are Jack letters. He just hadn't become Jack yet. Now he becomes Jack. So he's, he, he writes a couple of letters from the 1875 expedition. He seems not to have had any entree to that expedition other than he just sneaks his way in which seems to be the way you read the letters and you kind of can conclude this. Um, he has no letter of cover, no letter of introduction to, to Dodge or to Newton or Jenny, Jenny the, the officials of this expedition. Um, his letters report uh, his comfort with the uh, Teamsters you know, and in the corrals. And incidentally, here's what they found today and here's where they've been exploring today. I mean, the gold, the report of kind of the gold country is wonderful, but it's written undercover, as it were. Uh, so, he's, so, he's, so he's Ned. He seems to have been escorted out by General Crook. And in the summer of 1875, um, while government surveyors are trying to gain an estimation of the worth of the hills, because they've got to deal with the Indian side of this thing, uh, this is still national news. And there were a lot of people that didn't care about the politics of the thing, they wanted into the deal. And so there is this rush that is just booming. And Grant and Sherman and Sheridan sent Crook 
to get a hand on all of this because this is otherwise, this is an extra legal rush and we can't hardly tolerate this until we deal with the Sioux first. And so Crook goes out there in the summer of 76, or 75, and he posts uh, proclamations, you know, kind of throughout the diggings that invite all the miners to gather in the little budding Custer City in August and, and, uh, and document your claims, but you're going to leave with me. You can't be here now because this is Indian country. And, you know, and a lot of wink, a lot of, a lot of prospectors winked at that, and a few of them actually joined Crook. I mean, he marched out with a couple of hundred people, prospectors, when he left the hills that summer. And you strongly sense that Jack's in the middle of it because the letters cease. References to him pick up in the paper a little bit later um, in 1875 in the fall, announcing that Jack has returned to Omaha and Jack, our man Jack, is organizing a party and will lead a new expedition to the hills in January 1875. And that's where those letters started to, re to, to really appear, as I said. Between the departing as Ned and the return as Captain Jack, he became Captain Jack. And his biographers over the while, I've seen, I've seen what people, how they've tried to analyze, you know, well, when did Jack become Captain Jack? Um, and, you know, and maybe it's because he was this Civil War hero and he was wounded and all that. Or maybe it's because uh, he was an organizer of the Black Hills Rangers, which he was. But that didn't happen until later. And, uh, and he just mysteriously becomes Captain Jack because the first letter back, you know, in January is written, Cap signed Captain Jack. Well, what clearly seems to have happened is that he just went home and I guess he came to appreciate that if you wanted to a visibility, you know, in this kind of an environment, you needed a cachet. You needed something more than I'm just Ned. And he became Captain Jack. You know, and you could call me Major Paul if you want, and I think that's as simple as how he got to be Captain Jack, because he signs those letters that way. Um, and again, I think he's exposed to the wild bills and the buffalo bills of the world and the Texas jacks of the world, and so this just seems to be something that um, he adopted because it suited his purposes out there. Um, he adopts when he comes back, when he goes back, this unique persona as well. You see it in his descriptions of himself. You see it in the Omaha Bee woodcuts that, we've, that we know of. Uh, you see it in all the photographs, and that looks pretty much like Buffalo Bill to me um, because that's the way a plainsman or a frontiersman looked. So he not only adopted the name, but he adopted the look of a plainsman. Well, he goes out and he writes these marvelous letters, and as I say, I found as many as uh, as many as 40 of them, mostly to the Bee, um, some to the Black Hills Pioneer, one to the New York Herald, documenting six months in the gold country. That is just marvelous. Um, he documents how he got from, how, how you, if you were doing this, this is really for you, this is for the readers, how you got from Omaha, if you were heading to the hills, how you got there by way of Sydney, not by way of Cheyenne. The popular way is by way of Cheyenne, but the Nebraska interest is to promote Sydney. So his route is by way of Sydney. And north on a trail that's barely blazed north of there, a little more of a pronounced road to the agencies, but there is nothing beyond the agencies to Buffalo Gap and to Custer City, which continued to blossom. And he describes all that. So just his business of getting there is a sequence of letters that are just delicious. He gets to Custer City in January 1876, and you know, we're not mining in the wintertime. Uh, the, the, the gulches are frozen, the water's not running. There's people are there, there's a lot going on. But his next series of letters really just kind of account for or document and what you did in Custer City in the middle of winter and how you survived and what your hopes were and, and the reports, you know, they're filled with gossip, you know, kind of, well, I did work on Spring Creek last summer and here's what I found, you know, so he's just full of that sort of stuff. There's always this gold talk in the letters, as I, gold talk as I call it. They get really, well, in this time, one of the things you did is you organized yourself. Uh, you're there extra legally. And so if you're there, you're worried about how you protect your claim and how you protect the cabin that you had to build to own that lot. And uh, in the case that you might be like happened last summer, if Crook showed up again, you'd get escorted out. And, and he's describing all of this. 
and uh, how they elected a recorder of claims and how they elected a sheriff because they were not only worried about preservation of property but preservation of life as well. Getting there meant crossing Indian country and this is perilous country for quite a long while. Um, and he describes it, you know, not just that we did it, but it's, you know, Dale ran for sheriff and Bill ran for sheriff and Tommy ran for sheriff and, uh, and this was election day, and then in the next newspaper account, it's how many votes you got and how many votes you got and how many. So that's the kind of detail that's in here. You know, you can't, one will never be able to write this kind of history again without, without contending with Captain Jack and the specificity of all this. The meetings all seem, as they're organizing and they're just going about community affairs, mostly all take place at Al Swearingen's saloon in Custer. Now, maybe like, uh, like me, uh, maybe you uh, loved the Deadwood HBO special and, you know, where Al Swearingen is, you know, kind of the central character up there. Well, he's a character in Deadwood after he's a character in Custer, and he's every bit a character in Custer. And he runs a hurdy-gurdy, which is a, is a saloon and dance hall and brothel under one roof with a big common space, and so that was, as it was in the dead, what it very accurately predict, uh, depicted, that's the way it was in Custer. So all the meetings are always taking place at Al's, or at Swearingen's, um, whenever there was a call um, to, to, for citizens to gather. He describes the formation of the Black Hills Rangers. And in, the, uh, and in the lore of the Black Hills, in the earliest days of the gold rush, um, it's this, this is a militia organization composed of the able-bodied men who had horses and weapons um, in and around the Custer City area to protect themselves, you know, to run off uh, horse raiders, uh, horse thieves, or Indian raiders that seemed to plague the trails. Um, everybody knows of it, but the Jack letters tell us that it was on May 6th that the first meeting was called to organize the Black Hills Rangers. There's just that sort of specificity. And then every time they, they met and every time they, they organized and who the major that, that was the commanding officer, Jack is not that. Jack is the, Jack is, it's a scout. It's like being Captain Jack. He became the poet scout of the Black Hills. There's kind of a flair to that. And it kind of played into this notion, this presence of being a plainsman. Anyway, there's that kind of specificity too and it's just marvelous stuff. The best of the letters is, uh, pertains to the gold rush story. Um, when they're frozen and can't work the diggings, there still was gold news. But when they started to thaw, he as a reporter for the bee started exploring the landscape. And uh, he owned claims himself, but never seemed to work those claims. But he owned claims, and he'd tell you about that. But better yet, you know, he'd go down to claim 69 below Discovery, and they, were, they found gold this big, you know, and he'd describe, you know, the penny weight piece of gold or whatever it was. Or the day's cleanup. The measures were either some big old nugget that you could weigh, or the day's cleanup, and how many dollars you cleaned up. And, uh, and, and how many times you had to divide that cleanup, you know, amounted to a day's earned wage if you, were, if you were a prospector and you were a miner then. And his letters are just full of this sort of stuff. The story of the Black Hills Gold Rush, of course, is gold is discovered on French Creek. That's the creek that passes Custer, as we know Custer City today. Um, there's gold on Spring Creek and there's gold on Castle Creek and there's gold on on uh, Rapid Creek as you kind of advance northward. Um, always better gold, you know, out there. Custer City has gold. French Creek has gold still. You can go pan gold their day. They're mining. I was out there right after our Fort Robinson conference two days later, and there is something new going on on French Creek. But French Creek gold is fine little flake gold, and he describes it that was flake gold. He worked hard for flake gold. You know, that's just about as small as you're going to find as it's kind of eroded out. And, and passed and tumbled through, through creek bottoms for, for over the millennia. Um, but it gets coarser as you go north, and he's very good about describing that. And he's very good about reporting the news that was coming to him from Whitewood and Deadwood gulches, or creeks. That's where Deadwood and Lead are today. Um, the gold was just better the farther north you went. And he, read, he tells his readers that uh, that as fast as I can this spring, I'm going north and I'll visit 
the whitewood and, and, uh, and, and uh, deadwood diggings, and I'll tell you what I see. And the best letters of all are from there. Um, people that he had kind of communed with, had lived with for the preceding months in Custer City. You now, Custer City just vacates, you know, that's, that's, we thaw out in the spring of 76, and it just migrates north because that's where, that's where the action was. But he meets friends up there, you know, and the mirth, you know, of, of a full poke and a smile from ear to ear, guys that finally had made it big. And if you were lucky enough to hold a claim on Whitewater Deadwood, um, you made it really big. That was some of the richest placer diggings in all of the lower 48. Um, and he's just full of, his letters are just chock full of this stuff. And how you got there, I took a personal interest in just how you got there. I love this trail stuff. And, and uh, just the business of traveling from Custer, there are no highways, there's barely roads, there's no stage service yet. And when your wagon broke down, well, there was a broke wagon there and you borrowed a part from that wagon to make yours whole so you could continue on and the way he describes this stuff is just marvelous he tells his readers in um, in in late May that uh, this is after he's written a couple letters from from the north that I'm coming home and uh, I intend to organize yet another expedition for the North, but I'm coming home. And it took me a while to appreciate what, what I think was going on. Um, I think the guy simply hadn't been paid in a long while, and he may have owned claims, possessed claims, but he never, you know, you never get a sense that he worked those claims. I mean, he possessed them, but, and you had to, and you had to, and you had to represent, you know, and like every Sunday, you had to actually go out and demonstrate work on your claim or you'd lose your claim. So he knew how to do that, but he didn't make money out of this. Um, you could live in the diggings, uh, you could hunt a deer, and you could eat. But sooner or later, it costs you money to buy a new pair of pants or a new hat. And I think that ultimately drove him. Now, his cover, more than I'm coming home, his cover, um, as he tells his readers, is that I'm bearing gold ore samples to show because you know the nature of gold mining is the easy stuff is in the gulches. The placer stuff is the stuff that's eroded out and it's just there. It's hard work getting it, but it's easy. That gold came from the hard rock up here. And that's la not just labor intensive, but that's financially intensive. And uh, you don't move that at all without capital. And these people didn't have the capital. The capital was in Chicago and points beyond. And so he tells readers, I'm coming out with samples on behalf of the miners and prospectors that I've, uh, that I've communed with in Gayville and Deadwood and uh, to induce financiers to join the enterprise. And again, I think that's his cover because I think the guy's just penniless and he comes out to meet Rosewater and, gets, and, and settle up. This time, as he's coming out, um, he travels the, Custer, uh, the Cheyenne Road Everybody, all travel passed by way of Custer City, but at Custer City, you kind of angle southwestward toward, toward uh, to Cheyenne or southeastward to Sydney. And this time, he opted to travel the, uh, the Cheyenne Road. And in and around Hat Creek, where we were at the Fort Robinson Conference here just a little bit ago, in and around Hat Creek, he runs into Buffalo Bill. And this is just providential in his life. Um, they spend an overnight. Um, they are both gregarious characters. Um, we've fully grown uh, a, a Captain Jack character. His paper, his stories in the B are now being carried across the land. These accounts of, of his in the, in the gold rush country. And they had to, Jack had to have asked Bill, why are you here? And got back, well, I'm here with the 5th Cavalry as part of this ever-expanding Great Sioux War, or the Sioux War then. And, um, and Jack must have said, how do I get in? Because he continues on to, to Cheyenne and catches the train, and he accounts for all this, and he passes east, and he passes Omaha, and connects with Rosewater for a moment, but then continues on to, on to Chicago, because he's carrying these ore samples that he's professing to show to money men in Chicago. 
And while he's in Chicago showing gold to General Sheridan, Sheridan's office receives a telegram from Cody at Fort Laramie that passed by way of, you know, kind of Cheyenne and the way you did this, inviting him to join Crook at the front. And this all plays beautifully in the paper. And his response plays equally charmingly in the paper. I'm leaving Chicago. I'm bound for General Crook's camp. I'm joining the Sioux War. And the last of the letters, you know, which is to a Sioux War historian, this is, doesn't get any better than this, although this Gold Rush stuff, you can't tell the Sioux War story without dealing with the Gold Rush. Um, his, the last of his letters are his experiences on, with Crook on the Starvation March and in the Battle of Slim Buttes and as a message carrier, ultimately not for, for Crook, but for Reuben Davenport of the New York Herald where he secrets away, you know, as he's supposedly guiding Crook's messenger through the hills, because Jack knows the hills, he's a scout and knows the hills, knows how to get through, because Crook's messenger is duty-bound to, to get reports of the battle to the nearest telegraph, which was then at Fort Laramie, as quickly as possible. And so the two of them ride off, but Jack's carrying these other messages. And his messages, get to the wire before Gerard and Crook's messages get to the wire. And when Crook learns of this, and Gerard, Crook's scout, learns of this, uh, Jack is fired as a scout on the spot and thus ends his military career. He attempts to buy himself back into grace, but is entirely unsuccessful at that. Um, and so he comes down uh, through history as, you know, kind of one of the great dispatch carriers from the Battle of Slim It's reporting a very interesting encounter there. And Jack really is in the middle of it. And, you know, between his meeting Buffalo Bill at Hat Creek and um, Jack being at Slim Buttes, Buffalo Bill has his episode at War Bonnet Creek where he takes the first scalp for Custer, another of those acts of heroism on the frontier. Well, our man Jack takes a scalp at Slim Buttes, which he very clearly did. It's very well documented that he did. He sent it to his editor, Rosewater, at the B. Um, the, sc the scalp disappears into history, but he collects, and he seems to just disown that he ever did this, but he collects other trophies from that place in which I have a sense are still in Omaha, even to this day. Well, that's the story. My role um, was collecting them, and my role was introducing them, um, both the Gold Rush story and the Captain Jack story. They segmented really nicely, and so I, I, I did a setup to why there was this 1875 expedition and how Jack Crawford fit into that. And then I set up, uh, you know, kind of what life was like, as Jack is now telling you, but expanding and contextualizing it in Custer City in the winter time, and then what was going on as the gold rush just kind of progressed northward, and then you know what the Sioux War was all about anyway, and you know and how where Crook fits into this, and Buffalo Bill fits into this, and where Slim Beats fits into this. That was my role in all this, and I closed the whole thing off. Um, these characters just went on to have marvelous lives. Um, Jack and Bill, before there was a falling out, partnered together on Bill's next show season tour where they reenacted Bill's heroic first scalp for Custer on the stage for Eastern audiences, with Jack usually being the Indian yellow hair that gets killed and scalped and Bill proclaiming this thing. This is an episode that really happened out there and this is reenacted. The show ended up, closed its season in Omaha in April 1877. Um, Jack by then was, uh, having learned, having spent a, a season with Bill, had learned greatly of stagecraft, which I think he was being turned on to because he spends the rest of his life doing some version of this but also disgruntled that he was paid, this is the, there's a bitterness to some of this, he was paid, as he says, as much as the costumer was paid. And he had equal billing with Bill, but, you know, he got paid this and Bill got paid this, or earned this. 
Well, Bill was Bill, of course, and Jack was Jack, and Jack probably was worth what that costumer was, at least in Bill's, or costumer was paid, at least in, in Bill's eyes. They ended that season sourly, but, and Bill uh, dispatched or dis, you know, disassembled his, 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 uh, his crew, his stage crew, at, after the Omaha performances, and he went out to North Platte to his ranch, but within a few weeks, he had, was invited by interests in California to reassemble the show and bring it to California and play audiences there for another several months. And he comes back to Jack, because Jack really was kind of the yellow hair character in this, in the show they're going to continue, and induces him to join, you know, the, the, the company again. Uh, they negotiated a completely different wage, evidently a much more satisfying wage, and Jack signs on and they go out and play in California for several months. But then it really ends bad. They end this extended show season in Virginia City, Nevada. And on the stage, in the second to the last of the scheduled presentations, in gunplay, which was a part of this reenactment, um, Jack pulls his weapon and shoots himself in the groin with a blank, but a, a very serious wound, which, and where he's hospitalized for the next month. Bill closed the show, closes the show, doesn't pay the hospital bill, and when Jack finally is uh, released, his net for the extended tour, which was at a greater wage, was dollars and nothing more. And it leads to a bitterness between the two that I recount in that, in that conclusion that uh, just extended the rest of their lives. They die within weeks of each other in 1917. Crawford bitter to the last moment. Bill blowing him off any number of times because this thing surfaced, you know, that there was this, you know, <coughs> this little pissiness about it all. And, uh, and Bill says, you know, you know, I'm Bill, you know, and, uh, and people know that, and you're Jack, and I wish you all the best, but, you know, get over it is the way he put him off. Uh, but he just never could. Um, the other characters, uh, Rosewater, um, he dies at his desk, I think in 1906, um, in the B building in Omaha. Um, his son takes over, the paper folds finally, or is absorbed in the 30s. I really do wonder, you know, and I'll ask always, you know, whatever happened to the corporate papers of the Omaha B newspaper, this has got to be just extraordinarily rich, and have to, they have to be there someplace. They, they have to, they wouldn't have taken him to the dump, I just can hardly imagine. Um, he's buried in one of Omaha's uh, cemeteries. Um, well, that's the story of Captain Jack and uh, these very interesting, compelling letters uh, from the Black Hills Gold Country and from the Great Sioux War um, stuff. I think you can't tell these stories any longer without contending with, with uh, that written legacy, which is so, so rich. And we're about on time. I have time for questions and would welcome any. I thought that, um, that there were miscellaneous prospectors that discovered the gold and that Custer was sent out there to protect them from the Sioux. Is, is that right or is what did Custer discover the gold? Well, there is, there, the legacy of gold in the Black Hills is, is much deeper than just 1874, without a question. Um, DeSmet is, you know, apparently, you know, conversing with Indians who have gold. Um, there are prospectors in that country maybe as early as the 1830s that find gold. When Reynolds and Hayden are surveying out in that country in the 1850s, and they're not in the hills, they're not penetrating the hills, but they're working the margins of the hills, they announce gold, they've discovered gold, or they've seen gold. But the difference seems to be that that triggered nothing. So there's this lingering rumor of gold in the hills that uh, that was extremely important if you were a Dakota booster, but um, if you're a prospector, you, you know, the safer bets were Colorado and California at first and Idaho and even Wyoming for a while. But timing is everything and gold, that persistent rumor was important, linked with the panic of 1873, the economic despair the nation suffered beginning in that year and lasting for the rest of the 70s. Um, the prospect of of uh, you know, kind of the next El Dorado just loomed up. 
Custer was sent there not because to the Black Hills, not because um, there was this going on, because there were no, you get no sense that there's mining of any sort going on when he's there, uh, but he has practical miners with him in his entourage. His mission is to survey kind of the relative wealth of the hills, you know, its agricultural potential, its timber potential. Uh, this is, uh, the hills are more or less in the Great Sioux Reservation. His real purpose for being sent there was to find the location for a military post, which becomes ultimately Fort Meade out there. Um, but incidentally, they find gold, and the timing was everything, and his reports speak to it, and some newspapermen that are with him speak to it, and that just triggered the rush. So that's why he's, he gets credit for discovery because he's just at that right place at the right time where it all now lined up and there was a rush afterward. Yes? Who or what was yellow hair? Well, who or, yeah, who or what was yellow hair? Well, yellow hair, that's a, that's a Buffalo Bill episode. I, there's a very fine book inside that, uh, that I wrote long ago about this. Um, yellow hair, yellow hand, it's yellow hair properly, is a young Cheyenne warrior um, who Cody chances upon at Warbonna Creek. Yellow hair dies, and Bill takes his scalp. Now, this little episode is one of the first, it is the first encounter between soldiers and and, uh, and Indians after the Little Bighorn. And so as some of these soldiers from that place at War Bonnet are riding by and Cody is staring down this now dead Indian that he's killed by a long range rifle fire, um, he scalps him and holds it up and proclaims the first scalp for Custer, which most assuredly it was. Well, thank you all very much. This has been fun.